So hello, hello and welcome, and we're here at Holistic Investments, and I'm your host, Konstantin Kogan, and I'm delighted to have here with me uh, today Dan Wong, who is a CIO at YGGC, and uh, uh, also uh, Irene Umar, who is a co-founder and country manager of, uh, for Indonesia. Hi, Dan. Hi, Irene. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Excited to be here. Excited to chat. Likewise. So... Uh, for someone who doesn't know what is YGGC, that's basically a first sub of uh, uh, YGG, which is Yield Guild Games. That's, uh, um, there's a lot of things to unravel just from the name of it, right? <laughs> and then we're going to talk about the business model, about many exciting things in play to earn space and how the guilds are working, you know, what are they focusing on like, and how we partner together. But before that, we, as you know, in the show, we care about legal and compliance side. And so, so we should uh, throw a traditional legal disclaimer. So this content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, uh, investment, financial, or any other advice. Now that we're off the hook, let's just talk about anything we <laughs> relevant to our industry. Um, so we're going to start with both of you guys like you know i i know that uh you dan and uh, you irene are like you know been in the space for quite a while so maybe say a few words uh, how did you start you know ygg and you know what was what was the initial idea right um and you know what, what what's the actual um model between the sub dao what 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 it is in, in essence so I'll start by answering what YGG Southeast Asia is, right? YGG Southeast Asia is essentially a sub DAO from YGG and YGG Yield Guild Games. It's a DAO that started off in the Philippines. It was a very start of GameFi movement. And we noticed that at that time, there were a lot of play to earn players who want to jump into play to earn. However, they don't have the means to buy their first NFTs. And yet, we see that this is such a huge opportunity for everyone to start playing and earning money for their livelihood, especially during the time of COVID. And that's why with that in mind, uh, YGG was started in the Philippines and it impacts thousands of not many, many lives <laughs> for sure. And we see that a lot of people's life are changed. Uh, people who couldn't find a job, people who couldn't stay in universities by being a part of YGG, they now could start to earn a living and they could continue their livelihood even through COVID, even without jobs. Now, the big part of that is localizations. Philippines is such a huge success because YGG started off in the Philippines and they have a lot of Filipino space. Now, when we want to take models uh, elsewhere, localization play a huge factor because English is not it's a luxury. We might be speaking in the language right now as if mm -hmm. you know we're drinking water, but in a lot of countries, English is something that's that's an alien language, right? And by having a sub DAO in YGG Southeast Asia, for example, we have to localize Axie games or Axie cards, for example, into Thai, Bahasa, Malayu, and multiple languages so that people can understand and benefit from these movements. But the heart of it is essentially to remove the barrier to entry to enable anyone to be a part of the game fire movement by being a part of our guilds. That's why we pride ourselves in being the friendly faces for anyone who would like to come into the metaverse. And we welcome everyone to mint our badges of YGGC because that's gotta be your passport into the metaverse. Interesting, okay. Yeah. So before we go to minting, maybe Dan can help us to understand like the second part of the question, right? You know, so. Uh, what is the actual business model, right? You know, so maybe we can go from the evolution of the business model of YGG and how the sub DAO complements it. Mm, yeah, so um, kind of picking back on uh, to answer your question, piggybacking on what Irene said, you know, we we realized quickly uh, uh, with Gabby that um, you know gamers all around the world are very locally resonant, right? Uh, the different cultures, different behaviors. Uh, different socioeconomic status, different languages. Um, and that's why like well, in the web two or physical world, McDonald's has a McDonald's Japan and McDonald's India, McDonald's China, and you don't serve beef in McDonald's India, but 
fried chicken is the most popular in McDonald's uh, China, but there's no fried chicken on the menu in, you know, McDonald's US. Um, and that's because local tastes are different everywhere, right? And so when we thought about bringing the impact that we could um, to the rest of the world, we figured that the best way to do so was to create DAOs that would represent local player interests better, right? Um, and I think the reason why we could do that is because then as a local regional sub DAO, um, we are very specifically dedicated to Southeast Asia players only. Um, we don't take into account the taste of players in Japan or China or LATAM or North America. We get a real tight pulse uh, with a very quick feedback loop on that, you know, Southeast player, players like to play. Um, where and how they play it, um, you know, obviously mobile is the most dominant uh, form factor for playing games in Southeast Asia, um, but it's not in like North America or, or Japan or Korea, right? Um, and so combining all those, we created the business structure of, um, you know, business structure of these sub DAOs so that we can better represent the local players. We can better service their needs. Um, voices get drowned out if it's like a one, you know, one uh, size fits all organization. And so by, uh, through the sub DAO of YGG SEA, um, we pick and invest and partner with projects that we feel uh, will have the most resonance, uh, the best stickiness, and will be the most loved with the best earning potential for our players in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So let's let's try to go like a little bit more granular, right? And understand like how let's let's imagine I'm a player, like and I reside somewhere in Indonesia or Philippines or any like on Vietnam, right? I'm excited. I'm, I hear you. All sounds great. Like there is an opportunity to make money. Amazing. Like maybe to play a game and to earn more salary that I would do in my day job. Like where do I start? So it's very simple to be our scholars. Uh, we first of all just come over to our discord ygc sea and you'll find that there is an application a channel and inside the application channels you'll see the forms in multiple languages so choose the language that you want like to fill in the forms and mm -hmm. once you fill in the forms uh make sure you input the correct discord id because this is the main the main ways that we could contact you because a lot of scholars they put a, a Discord ID and then tomorrow they change their Discord ID and we couldn't find them, right? So just that's the only thing that you have to do. And we would, we would definitely DM you and pay attention also to the scholarship announcement. We will let you know when the interviews happen. So for each of our scholars, we do interview them because we value the scholars as a human, not just a data point. We'd like to get to know more about them and we'd like to know where they are from. The reason for that is because we do have trainers and community leaders spread all around Southeast Asia that will be physically closest to the scholars so they could better help them. Because Constantine, we all remember the first time we created our MetaMask wallet, how well, don't think that experience could be, right? And as someone who would like to be that friend, friendly face for the community, we want to have that closeness. So it's not, YGGC does not exist only in the metaverse, not only in online through discords and whatnot, but we also exist offline in, in people's life. Amazing. So very so simple, come over to our Discord. So, okay, so I go through application and providing my Discord, and uh, that's the first step. Like, you, we know that you already have, like, more than 5,000 scholars, and I'm sure the numbers will increase greatly, which I sincerely wish you so. Now, what is the next step? What is your criteria of evaluating, let's imagine you have 10,000 applications, how, and you do one-on-one -on -one interviews. So, give us some sneak peek, like, how would you... How would you choose one scholar to another? Like, am I do I have to be friendly, or do I have to tell you that I will spend ten hours playing a game, or rather than someone who will tell you I will spend only four hours? What's the criteria? The criteria is simple. If you are committed, you are not. The last thing we want, right, is someone who used. Trust me, Constantine. There are people who use other people's IDs card to apply sure. as scholars, so that they can play two accounts from a guild. That's the only thing that we do not want because we are committed to build a community of gamers who are passionate and who are honest and have a high integrity. The relationship that we have with our community members are not related to how much token prices are, right? And we don't want that. That's the only, the only, only, only criteria because we mm -hmm. embrace oneness, whoever you are, 
we embrace you into our community. And as long as you don't do multi-accounting, as long as we are, you are allowing us to give opportunities, equal opportunities to everyone, then you are welcomed into the metaverse. And we are working very hard. Dan is every day, the conversation that we have is Dan, when can I have more game assets to deploy? When can I have more game assets to deploy? Because we want this to reach out to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's very simple, Constantine. And in okay. terms of ranges of people, right? People often ask me, what about the age? So the minimum age is 18 years old, or if you can have an ID card. And the only reason for that is because we need, we need them to be able to exchange into fiat money, right? And the exchanger needs you to have an ID card before you can open an exchanger account. That's the only reason. And okay. the age limit, none. We have scholars who are 50 plus and they are playing games and they are rocking it. I'm sure. Listen, why not? Uh, they have a lot of time if they're retired. Now, the question is, so are you, uh, so imagine someone found you randomly from, from the interview or from somewhere else, like not from South a Southeast Asia, right? Maybe from Europe or from South America. Would you accept them? To YGGC, what we do is we will route them to the LATAM site because mm -hmm. our site in Indonesia, for example, we speak all our communities, we speak in Bahasa, all right? If suddenly you come in, you'll be like a lost child, and that's the last thing that we want. <laughs> well, I have to learn <laughs> the language, you know? <laughs> well, if you would like to learn the language, we'd be happy to welcome you, right? <laughs> but having, having that closely knitted community is extremely important, and that's the very reason why we have the sub mm -hmm. So The reason why we have sub so fast within less than a year it's, it's simply to, so that we could better serve the community. So, okay, so uh, let, let's go to a practical aspect. So uh, the application accepted. So you assign a manager and team lead to me, like who's going to educate me, onboard me, right? So what is next? You help me to set up a MetaMask. You explain me, like you give me some videos, how to play games and how can I pick, let's say, YGG versus Av Avigochi, right? You know, so help us to understand a little bit more, like, you know, what's the practical day-to-day -day of a scholar? So day-to-day -day of a scholar is, is extremely simple, right? Right? They log into the Discord, they could chat in Discord because the moment they accept it as a scholar of YGGC, accordingly to which countries they are from, there's a new <laughs> sub channels that's open up just for them. Mm -hmm. And all of those are chattering in local language, right? So a typical day for a scholar, they come into the Discord channels and they'll be like, oh, I would like to open a MetaMask wallet. How do I look at it? Of course, we will. We can't do one-on-one -on -one for everyone, right? So we do have a, have a quote -unquote, encyclopedia for it on what they have to do on the first week of, of onboarding. That's one. Second, we do, have in, we do have installed buddy system in place. So imagine you go to a new school, right? So it's, it's like you come into YGGC and you're like a new kid in the block. I don't know what to do beyond creating MetaMask wallet, beyond asking questions. So there's a buddies who look after 10, 20 scholars that first comes in so that they get a hang of it and they wouldn't feel so awkward being a new kid on the block, right? And mm -hmm. we also have training sessions. So the training sessions we have at least once a day in Indo. In Malaysia, I think once a week, at least Vietnam also once a week and uh, Thailand as well. The reason is because Indo, Indo's population is, is quite big, right? And uh, so we have one to two sessions per day. Now, scholars can come in and look at the schedules and say, oh, I'm, I'm available at this hour. And I'd like to know about the training. So they could, they could go in and join. And there, there are a few community programs. So we have uh, tournaments as well, just for, just for uh, the local community, the local scholars, like right now it's Ramadan season. So we have Ramadan tournaments as well. So there are folds of programs that are localized in each countries that we do uh, within the Discord. And most of the time we also take it offline. Just two weeks ago, there's a festival that we participated in, the first NFT uh, festival in Jakarta. And I think that's the first offline event that we conduct. Second, sorry. The first one was in Thailand, a tournament as well. This is the second one that we participated in, where we showcased uh, new games, Galaxy Fight Club and Draku Master, uh, that was not launched yet, but people are able to get a flavor of it. And we onboard scholars as well on spot. Oh, interesting. So you can also onboard scholars to a game that, like... I uh, haven't been listed yet. That's that's also an interesting sneak peek because 
that 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 helps to understand if somebody like one of the founders are listening to us, right? And they want to launch an amazing game, they can also collaborate with you, right? And they can is there an, another application or they can write just directly to provide their game? So because I want to talk about this side of the things as well. So we talked a little bit about scholars. So let's talk about the criteria of the 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 games itself. What are you looking at if you want to onboard another partner? As a game, you know, right now we, we probably talk to 20 or 25 different projects a week um, of all varying different game modes and genres. Um, there hasn't been a specific formula we follow on games, uh, but there's a few bits of criteria, right? Um, we want to make sure that the game is sustainable. Um, you know what? We usually make sure, like, uh, aside from the sustainability, that it's fun, right? We want uh, uh, clever core game loops. Um, good design and balancing, um, and we want to make sure that the onboarding uh, experience is fairly clean. Um, you know, just like uh, Irene was saying earlier, you know, creating the first MetaMask while it was kind of intimidating, playing your first GameFi game, not knowing if a decision I make might have financial impact on me, or like if I do the wrong choice, or how do I do this? Do I bind my account to to this game, or uh, do I use this NFT or that NFT? Um, we want to make sure that the games that we're partnering with have very good onboarding tutorial uh, support uh, community, so that. Um, you know, our players and our scholars uh, have folks to reach out to. Um, when it comes to like who exactly we partner, we, we actually diversify quite a bit. Um, and that's because, you know, not everyone likes playing the same type of games. Um, some people like playing turn-based battlers. Some people like playing auto chess. Some people like playing MOBAs or first-person shooters. Um, some people like dungeon scrollers and, and MMOs, uh, ARPGs and so we've actually invested and partnered with projects uh, in all of these categories. Um, we try and make sure we have very good coverage of the type of games uh, and, and uh, experiences that we have to offer our scholars so that we have a little bit of something for everyone. And like Irene was saying, you know, we, we welcome pretty much anyone in the community. Um, so, you know, we'll, through the buddy system and the scholar and community managers, um, they'll get an understanding of, you know, what do you like to play? How many hours a day do you like to play? Um, and then they'll help pair the, the scholars with the right experiences, the right game, something that fits uh, for that specific scholar. Um, and obviously taking into consideration like the earnings component as well. Um, so that way, you know, my job is to help provide Irene and all of our players in Southeast Asia um, opportunities uh, that are fun, engaging, sticky and sustainable and lucrative in terms of earnings. Um, you know, we, we do focus on mobile primarily since most of our players play on mobile first. Um, you know, if we, if we picked a game like Cyberpunk 2077 or Elden Rings, it's a great game, but so few players in our community can actually have the equipment or the hardware necessary to play that. So we would actually probably opt out of partnering uh, with that type of games. So okay. And when you say mobile, just to just to also specify this, you you mean Android, right? Because I assume that like in US we have a lot of obviously Apple users and in a, in a lot of countries. Like, but I, I think the the dominant like you know phone, smartphones in you know South Asia is Android based, right? Yes, uh, so I, I do mean mobile in general um, because mm -hmm. there are, you know, iPhone users, but the, the majority is uh, uh, I, uh, Android users. Yeah. Okay. Because so, so 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 any any specific like any other like things that you know like a founder needs to know. So for example, again, you, you look at when you say the game should be sustainable, right? So you're talking you're looking at token metrics. You look at you know the you know like roadmap, the plans, yeah. everything. So do you have any other like questionnaire that, you know, you're providing to them that they have to fulfill and uh, to go through due diligence? Yeah, we'll, we'll usually get a good understanding of the team developing it, right? We want to make sure that uh, they're here for the long run, that they have sufficient staff to execute on the vision or roadmap that they've uh -huh. promised our community. Um, you know, the last thing we want is, you know, MVP of some game launches, but then, you know, uh, not a rug pull, but maybe they don't dedicate all the staff to it or they don't scale up properly. And so the different game modes that they promised aren't launching on time or it's continually delayed. Um, you know, that's a big concern of ours. So we will dig very deeply into that. Um, I can say that we, we tend to favor games that have 
sufficient content and variation in game modes and even maybe IP within the game uh, so that it's engaging uh, for different types of players and different uh, uh, and you know, for different lengths of time, um, you know, we we also look very closely for uh, games that have good tokenomics that has uh, good earnings, but also uh, sustainable. Meaning, we don't want to optimize for like the first thousand players that just came in, and you know, they'll make a hundred x on the NFTs plus the earnings, and then the next. 10,000 are subsidizing that first thousand, um, you know, to some extent that will always happen. Um, and that's okay, but uh, we prefer to see it a little bit more balanced, right? We, we'd rather not partner with a flash in the pan where the majority of folks um, end up holding the bag. We'd rather something that, okay, maybe the earn isn't as high, but the longevity is there because there's better burn mechanisms in the game. Uh, there's more NFT utility, there's interoperability of the NFTs maybe between their different game modes, but then the reward system is different. It's not always the utility token or the governance token. Um, and then also we look for things that have a huge social element. Uh, things like PVP or leaderboards, uh, little mini tournaments integrated into the game so that players that want to are able to kind of almost like wager in, opt in, pay a little bit out of their own pocket um, or, you know, uh, to compete in these games uh, with the prospect of uh, earning a much, much larger pool or pot if they win. Um, things like this end up creating a, a, like I said, a more sustainable ecosystem within the game uh, and just a better environment for our players. Um, because, you know, the last thing we want is cool. Let's just say it's a game that super successful two or three months uh, game. You know, our scholars make a lot of money. And then in two months, they got to switch to the next game, right? Mm -hmm. Like that churn is not great, not a great experience. And they got to ramp up on a whole nother game and everything. And maybe 10, 15% of the uh, player population is happy. And then everyone else is not, right? And so um, I think that's in general kind of the, the criteria we look for. Um, amongst, you know, just general uh, investment and partnership firms. So that, that's really, and we'll come back to the churn question, but I, I, let's do a quick blitz. I have like three questions. We'll do like short Q&A, like in this context. So um, so what's the what's the revenue model between, let's imagine like I'm the founder, you know, YGGC. So how do we split, you know, the revenues? Generally for our scholars, um, depending on the game, we'll figure out what the most sustainable and fair balance of revenue split is. Um, different games have different uh, revenue split, um, anywhere from 50-50 to 70-30 in the favor of scholars. Um, and it really depends on one, kind of like the cost of our NFTs, the entry barriers, how many NFTs we can get in the game. And then and what we've modeled out internally might be the average ROI time that we think it'll take to return you know, our capital investment, uh, but also is worthy to, for the player to spend enough time. You know, if it was like 10, 20, $30 a month, we probably will have to adjust that. Uh, we want to make sure it's balanced at a level that uh, it's fair for everyone involved. Okay, so let's go quickly. 50-50, who gets 50? So Scholar gets 50 and you get 50 as YGGCs. Yes. Okay. yes, of, of the... Of the tokens or nfts or things generated in the game now um, what's the average 70, 30 in favor of the i understand and there are different models so what's the average earnings like you know in let's imagine in dollar equivalent it's just easier to calculate like you know per scholar i mean obviously you have different games different time people spend there like you know so but did you make an uh, analysis? What's the average? The average is pretty wide uh so it's not from as low as forty dollars mm -hmm. per month, all the way to a thousand dollars per month. Got it. Now, obviously, different games. You know, they have different compensation and also different cycles, right? You know, when it's early in the game and they provide a lot of incentives like staking and like some airdrops, so you can you can farm more, so to speak, right? You know, if if it's later stage, it's you know it can go a little bit lower than you there. So. What is so so okay? What is the split with the project? So again, I'm the owner of the project. I I have a great game. Imagine right, and I come to you guys and I say, listen, you have access to five thousand scholars. I want to work with you. So what? So I just I just need to provide you tokens, NFTs, whatever the negotiation is, like you know, and then you kind of take care of it. Like so, uh, help us to understand how does it work on a, behind the curtains. Yeah, so a uh, uh, great question. Um, 
uh, I can take, for example, a Karmaverse that we actually were, we just onboarded about another 3,000 scholars just for Karmaverse. Nice. That's a pretty big partnership that uh, we've announced. We're also uh, invested you know, in them. I don't know if you know that as well. Yes. So they're, it's a great, 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 great studio, great team. Um, and a good example of multi-IP, multiple game modes, uh, excellent delivery timeline, um, and sustainability, right? Um, and so, you know, with them, you know, kind of behind the curtains, we'll discuss with them, like, cool, we want just enough tokens so that we have utility, uh, be able to be able to use those tokens for utility in the game, uh, breeding, leveling up for our scholars, et cetera. Um, and then we actually focus mostly on NFTs. Uh, we'll go to the project and tell them like, okay, well, what's your, what's the initial uh, DAU that you want to onboard? What's the maximum amount of numbers that you're going to mint in this first wave so your first community gets built? Uh, and then we'll say, okay, well, we have this many scholars. Let's say it's 600 that we think would want to onboard immediately. So how many NFTs would that take? Is that a sufficient portion of your overall mint? Is it too big, too little? Um, and then we'll kind of negotiate back and forth on the exact number of scholars that we want to bring in. Um, and then the type of activities we'll do around it, you know, content creation, tutorials, serving as a distribution platform and channel uh, for them. Um, and then we'll obviously talk about, okay, well, what is the price? Um, you know, generally, you know, we'll negotiate with the projects based on, you know, kind of the value that we bring uh, from the community, but also from a distribution platform angle. Um, and then we'll negotiate usually a, a slightly discounted price, uh, OTC, uh, so that we can then uh, deliver, structure the N NFTs into different wallets based on the, the correct meta, uh, and then distribute it to our, our scholars. So what, what is the uh, percentage then? then? Let, let's, let's, let's go to business. What is the percentage that you're taking in average? Like, what is the fee? Oh, we don't. So actually, we don't take a fee from the games. We actually mm -hmm. ask them to give us instead of any fee or any like service fee or content creation fee, we ask for them for a discount on the NFTs. So, exactly. Um, yeah. that, that way we can we can deploy and buy more NFTs for our players. Um, so generally, you know, we ask for like a minimum of 20 percent uh, mm -hmm. for some games that actually have. You know, for example, have minted a lot of NFTs, but it aren't fully sold out. Um, we've gotten free NFT airdrops for our entire community, uh, three or four hundred scholar worth. Um, and it, so it really depends on the situation. Uh, if it's a very crowded game, um, generally it's a little bit harder to negotiate a significant discount. And in that case, we'll probably something accept something like 20 or 30 percent um, with conditions that like, look, we don't. We don't sell, we hold all these, we provide ultimate utility of these because you know you're going to have DAU from our scholars every single day uh, utilizing the NFTs in the game, not just holding it and speculating it and flipping it, right? And so based on that, most games are very willing to partner with us uh, and give us a slight discount because they know it's going to be used, right? No, that makes a lot of sense. So just, just wanted to understand this, uh, like the the openness and in terms of the discounts and everything so that uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in this part, like, cause that's not a public information you cannot get in. Like that's the insights we're getting now from you guys. And I'm grateful that you're sharing them. Like, you know, so, um, so we, we talked a little bit about the churn and the, you know, like how let's, let's imagine a scholar who's playing one particular game, maybe two games in, in, in simultaneously, right? You know, one by one, right? So uh, during the day, like how, in your opinion, what is a lifetime of a particular game in your ecosystem? Like, you know, how long does it take you, like a scholar to be a little bit bored in the particular game and to switch to another one? I think that's, that's a very difficult to end to answer because it depends on every game and a lot of game developers will not be able to answer with ease also. Now, the, the life of a game would very much depends on a few factors. One is um, how fast does the game developers adjust to the game tokenomics? Because when we, for game developers, right, <laughs> their job is pretty difficult because it's like as if they are creating a new country. So a new country Imagine this, from the start of the country, from the birth of a country, they can't predict how many citizens they will have, even though if they have birth control, right? So the same goes on to the games and how much uh, of the earning tokens is going to be there, 
right? And how much governance tokens needed. So the key to success of every games is on the game developers. How fast did they adopt to this? As the gamers, as the game uh, gamer space grows, how did they introduce burning mechanism that is fast enough to tackle this? As long as the game developers are proactively monitoring the pulse of their economics and taking actions to it, results could be different. But as long as they continue to take actions to it, I believe in the game. Because the worst thing is they don't do anything about it. Irene, so I, would, website- I would vote for you as a politician. I, I, I swear to God, like, but I, <laughs> I, need a, I need an answer. So what's the average time frame? You can tell me from the, the smallest to the biggest one, right? You know, so that, that will help people to understand, like, you know, just, you know, just the life cycle. I understand that it's probably sensitive data, but if you, if you can answer it. Yeah. Sure, I, I can touch on this a little bit. Um, and to be fair, out of all the games that we've partnered with, there's really only one that we've made the decision to kind of pull out of because um, players aren't that excited by it, the earnings not that great, um, and it was not worth the bandwidth of our, you know, we have limited bandwidth and, and, and uh, staff to support. One, one out of 40, um, right? You have 40 plus games. Uh, 40 plus games. Although if you think about it, only like eight or nine have launched. Right. So really, it's just one out of eight or nine. Uh, The rest, you know, actually, they haven't been on the market that long. If you think about it, the play to earn space is still fairly new. Uh, The games that we've rolled out, um, aside from Axie, the next longest one, Star Sharks, has only been out four months. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's still a little early to say. Um, But in this shortened timeline, there's only been one game that we've discovered that like, uh, the response and kind of the the in-game balance tweaks weren't quick enough and the developers weren't supportive enough of community feedback that we felt it wasn't worth our time anymore to continue supporting it. And so that one had a lifespan of about two months, three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that, every game that we've entered, we're still in and, um, you know, we haven't sold uh, any NFTs that we get. So even if we get at a discount, it's, yeah, it's never hitting the market. So. No, that's actually very helpful. So that means like besides this one game, which is fine, you know, we, you know, community reacts and they also have their own opinion and their own like preferences, what game to earn that they dictate the market, right? So that means like for more than like, you know, several months of your existence, you know, like there you, you have active players, you know, after active scholars, like people who actually support all those games simultaneously. Now, the question would be if you have already nine that are active, so, and you have, let's imagine, just take rough number of 5,000 people. How do you split them like between 5,000 people? So obviously as a human being, I can play only maybe one or two games per day, right? Based on the preference, as you mentioned, Irene, so basically you you assign specific game to a specific person according to their preference, right? And then the community lead is monitoring, like, you know, if you're still satisfied or maybe if I have, uh, I changed my mind, I want to try on some other game, right? And then you that you actually actually ask the community manager that, you know, can I switch? Is this somehow close to the reality? No, uh, yes, yes and no. But to give you the complete picture, right, of mm-hmm. sneak peek of how it is, we do divide the games into two sides, right? Uh, one part is the games where the first layer games, we call them the primary games. So when, when scholars come in and enter, uh, they would be assigned either one of the primary games. And the reason why those are primary games are because those are good indicators to, to check or test the skills of the gamers when they first come in, the commitment and whatnot. And um, for the other games, the secondary games, because we a lot of times the players spend around 30 minutes to two hours right, per game. So they do have, and most people, they play games more than that. Mm-hmm. So for those who uh, volunteer to become a buddy, to become trainer, to become community leaders, we do give them options to have more than one games. That's uh, an incentive for them to play more than one games. And by playing more than one game, then they would be able to understand better about each game and then they would be able to train more people. Now, we do not just say, hey, you are a buddy right now, so I'm going to give you two games. No, right? The reason why Dan goes out there and invests in 40, 50 games is so that we can provide varieties. So we give them, we will tell them there's this assets that's coming out. Who would like to join? Who would like to play this game? Come and apply to us. So the first, uh, first come, first serve, whoever who apply first and who haven't got the second game will assign those to them. Mm-hmm. 
Got it. And again, so as a, as a guild also, like, you know, so people, for, for someone who wants to understand better how the gaming guild works, so that's, that's your, basically, that's your job, you know, like to help, like, you know, the, to identify the best games, right. And to filter them from, from the noise that we have a lot in <laughs> play turn space, especially, you know, like this beginning of this year and previous year. And, and then to identify the best opportunities, whether it's a token or it's an NFT, right. Um, and then, then you, 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 you help to navigate all the operational side and technical side, right. And the DAO component helps to make it fair and transparent. Um, so, okay. So this part is more or less, well, I, I, I tortured you a little bit, but more or less we were clear, right. <laughs> so we have a scope. So now you also now. As, as far as I understand it, you're also getting into metaverse and, you know, like you're getting into um, metaverse assets, like, you know, building, buying, selling, borrowing, like, you know, and different, like, you know, opportunities that are coming up in the, in this uh, new web 3.0 space. So can you talk a little bit about the, the economical incentives for the games that are also like now getting into metaverse or having their metaverse already? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's actually a great uh, segue because I think, you know, we're seeing the, the types of games players like to play uh, and the ways they earn start to shift. Um, obviously, the one of the most popular, uh, Axie, uh, you know, uh, that kind of led the industry and uh, played to earn for quite a while. Um, but these, these initial batch of like single title IP uh, earning focused or earning first games uh, are starting to suffer because, well, after a while, like you talked about, there's some fatigue, right? Players want to do something else. They want different IP or different uh, uh, content, different game modes. And, and so we've seen a drift towards uh, multi-game mode uh, platforms, multi-game, uh, multi-IP games uh, to keep players interested. Um, and then uh, one of the other things would be, um, you know, in the metaverse, actually, it becomes like an open world right? Uh, players can actually go in and do whatever they want. Now, the reason why like players haven't rushed into that is because it's, uh, it's confusing. It's scary. You have infinite number of choices. Um, so really, we're kind of teaching them how to get there by introducing players to different types of games on the way there. Now, once you enter kind of a metaverse play or open world or MMO, actually, these are pe people and players players that are there for the gameplay experience first. And so if you think of like World of Warcraft, you're going to have people that like me, that like, I just want to raid uh, PVE. I just going to want to go, you know, uh, farm the dungeon. I don't want to farm eight hours for my mats, for my consumables, flasks, yeah. armor, whatever. I just want to buy the gold or I want to buy the flax off the auction house. And so actually you're going to have some players are like, Oh, cool. Well, I like the environment. I don't mind farming uh, in the barren lands for six hours to get enough, you know, whatever leaf or herb or gold to then sell and craft something. And so there's still going to be economic incentives for people. And this basically bridges those, uh, arbitrages the, va the variables of like time and value of time, mm -hmm. right? And so I think um, that's definitely coming down the pipeline, probably not in the next like three to six months because just the overall industry needs to mature, uh, but it's definitely coming and we've invested in a lot of projects like that as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure there are going to be a lot more partnerships in this round because, you know, Metaverse is getting bigger and bigger. We're still yet to understand what it is, but um, two, like, one, uh, probably one of the last questions I'll ask you is going to be personal. It's not, uh, so I'm giving you each person to reply in one sentence. I haven't notified you. It's going to be a tough one. Um, so, but that's a traditional question in my show and that's the beauty of it, right? So question is very uh, simple yet uh, deep. Uh, so uh, we live and we have meanings to we give meanings to everything, to business, to life. So what's your meaning of life? Making an impact on players in the industry I'm passionate about. Beautiful. Irene? Meaning of life is doing business because in Chinese, Shen Yi means purpose of life and through YGG, that is what I'm doing. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that, love it. So listen, guys, I, 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 like, I, I, like how our, uh, I like how our country manager went to the business and the CIO went to player impact. Uh, so a little <laughs> bit of a role reversal. And that's why, that's why you complete each other. You know, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> 
yes. That's why we are yes. Robin and Batman. <laughs> yes. No, but, but it's real though. I like, I like the way you end the, end, the, end the interview because a lot of people are doing things without, without knowing what's the purpose of life. And yep. what I've answered to you is this real because I'm sure. certainly that, that is really the point. The-